Hello, everyone. A moment while I get situated here. I have my tablet here for tracking if anyone has any comments or questions as in the moment. So I, uh, if you want to chat or ask a question while we're while we're going here, I have the tablet. I'm not going to respond. I'll just see what, oh dear, just see what you have, uh, what you've asked. And at the very least, you can, you can holla, as we say. Today, we're going to have our catechesis for about 45 minutes. And we're going to continue now that we're on the other side of Holy Week um, and into Easter. You know, I think I'm going to turn down the light a little bit. Need more, need a little bit of mood lighting. Now that we're on the other side of Holy Week and into Easter season, perhaps we have some fresh inquiries that we can make together. So questions about our worship during Holy Week, the refracted white light of Easter refracted into our liturgies of Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter itself. Questions abound with all of that. I read from St. Bonaventure's The Mystical Vine, along with Carlo Martini's, in my opinion, classic, but it's not very old, Our Lady of Holy Saturday, his reflection on how Holy Saturday before Easter, after Good Friday, sort of weird time liturgically is par excellence, understood as a devotion to the faith in the resurrection demonstrated by Mary. Anyway, I don't want to, you, you worshiped with, right along with me during Holy Week, so feel free, please, to ask questions about any of that. But I want to pick up a little bit where we were when we left and broke for Holy Week, which was talking about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was St. Peter's teaching in the chapter of Pentecost. His preaching went on. Continue with receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit as what's most fundamental about our religious liturgical life of prayer. Okay? That's why we do it all. That's why we do offices. That's why we have the Mass. That's why we have personal devotion. It's to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're baptized. That's why we receive the Eucharist. And just on and on right down the line to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not like we receive a present, open it, it's done, move on, but rather more like how do we receive a person into our family who's going to live with us for the rest of our lives? Constant hospitality. Or how do we receive a book that we're going to spend the rest of our life reading? Right? To not just read the book, the letters and the words and the arrangement that they're on the pages, but to deeply receive the message and the meanings and the enlightenment of a book, right? that kind of reception. But before we get too far into that, uh, we have to start with prayer. I have my favorite prayer for this catechesis. It's a classic with an Anglican liturgy, let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, 
read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God forever and ever. Amen. So, receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I mean it the same, although I, sometimes I'll say gift, sometimes I'll just say receiving the Holy Spirit. I mean the same thing. And, it, you know, as we, when we remember that, that Acts is also written by Luke, so much so that scholars refer to the, both books as almost one book, Luke Acts, there's a through line. There's more to it than this, but there's a there's an overall through line of receiving the Holy Spirit. To, if we trace it backwards, at Pentecost, by the three thousand who were baptized, received the Holy Spirit. How? Through the religious life called the threefold regula, the interrelationship within practice of daily offices, morning and evening, situated. Of, uh, around the Eucharist and then filled out with our life of personal devotion according to the scriptural revelation as love in the world. All of that, our religious life, is how we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it starts there, traces just a little bit back to the upper room, the nine days that the 120 members of the Upper Room Church, the first Christian church, waited, having been sent there apostolically by Christ to be apostles, waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit, waiting to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, So receiving the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, receiving the Holy Spirit over those nine days, which, as I've said before, I think we can reasonably say is where the threefold regular started to come to be, to, to gestate in the womb of the upper room. And then on, on the 10th day, it went boom. Okay, so Pentecost, and then upper room, and then beginning of Luke's gospel is the Annunciation to Mary and her fiat, her be it unto me according to thy word, her reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit through her obedience, through her humility, through her trust and total dependence, trust in and total dependence upon God. So Mary, upper room, Pentecost. It's all one through line of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the, the second and the third are simply elaborations by a group of people of Mary's yes. So Mary said yes. The upper room parishioners said yes, and the 3,000 people said yes. So 1 to 120 to 3,000, but it's all the same yes in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit based on our trust and uh, our trust of God. Now, however, there is support for, I think, understanding what it means to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit elsewhere. Um, and today I want to start to look at John's Gospel. And I, I think I said a couple times ago, but if I didn't say it this specifically, I would, you know, when I was asked in what order would I recommend reading the books of the New Testament, and I said, well, you read the Passion accounts of the four Gospels first, just the passion accounts, in other words, the ends of the four Gospels first. And then you move on to Paul's letters and the other letters. And then when you sort of exhaust the letters, then you go read the four Gospels through from the beginning. Well, which passion narrative to start with? I would say to start with John, and not only his passion narrative, but then when you get back to reading the whole Gospel, um, John. And the reason is because... It's a different character than the other three. And I think you have to have that character 
to get the most out of Mark, Matthew, and Luke's gospel. And that character is that Jesus, from the moment, the first moments of John's gospel, Jesus is transfigured. The other three gospels accounts have the actual transfiguration description when Peter, James, and John. I don't think that's right. Peter, John, and Andrew. Well, anyway, three disciples were witnessing of the transfiguration of Christ. And so Matthew has one, Mark has one, and Luke has one. John doesn't have a description of the transfiguration. That's because Jesus is transfigured from the very beginning of John's gospel all the way through. That's an important characteristic and difference between John's gospel. Also, John, John's gospel is the only one written that is certifiably by an eyewitness to the cross. Um, and it's you know, written by the beloved disciple who, who rested his head on Jesus' heart at the Last Supper. So there's an intimacy to John's gospel that the others uh, don't have which is not really a weakness of the other three. It just is such a strength of John's gospel that I think it's important to wrestle with John's gospel first. Well, we're not going to talk about all of John's gospel today. <clears throat> There's a part of John's gospel that comes near the end before the Passion, which is chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. 14 through 17, those chapters in John's gospel are called his farewell discourse. It's called a farewell discourse because it's the last teaching that Jesus gave the disciples in John's gospel. And I, I mean that in the sense of extended teaching. And, you know, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 make for an extended discourse or, or teaching okay i mean jesus taught from the cross i mean the words that he said from the cross of course are immensely rich in teaching for us i mean it's not like jesus is lecturing in this farewell discourse but if you'd like to see if, you, if that's helpful like these chapters comprise something of a lecture um you know in ways that the teaching he did from the cross does not. So if you turn to chapter 14 in John's gospel, we're just going to start to read. I'm going to skip a little bit, but, and the, the, the thing to notice as we go here is what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. So I have the Revised Standard Version translation. Your, your translation might be different, but it's not going to be so different that I don't think you can follow along if you are following along with your Bible. If you're not, I don't think you're going to lose anything since I'm going to read everything out loud and comment upon it. But anyway, starting with chapter 14 in John's Gospel, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He had just told Peter that Peter would deny him three times. Um, he has already washed their feet, and he has already done the Last Supper. Okay? Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. But I mean, This is right on the heels of telling Peter in front of everybody that Peter would deny him three times. Okay? So that, that I think we should not underscore or we, we should underscore that, that probably created a, a sense of alarm or concern amongst the, the 12 who were gathered at this point. Okay. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. 
If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And notice the words there, and where I am, you may be also. I've said that understanding Jesus' presence after the resurrection and ascension is understanding his I amness, his his actual presence in the community and in the world, his glorified and resurrected body, his, his I amness in Jesus many times throughout John's gospel used the phraseology, I am, I am the true vine, I am the good shepherd. And furthermore, Jesus at one point says, before Abraham was, I am. I am is one of Jesus's titles. Okay. That where I am, you may be also. So we're now in verse four. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am, there we go again, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Then he goes on in verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. That detail is rather stunning, that... We who believe in Christ will do works greater than he did before he died. Of course, that's greater works than his because owing to him working through us. He can be in more physical places now through us then he could before he died, because before he died, it was just him, with his body. After he died and ascended to the Father, his body can be anywhere where people who are baptized live. See? Verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, here's where we get into the Holy Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Counselor is one of the titles of the Holy Spirit. And he will give you another counselor to be with you forever even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Him being the spirit of truth. So here Jesus is indicating that the Holy Spirit is properly a he. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. 
see there that the Holy Spirit is already in them, for he dwells with you. He's with, the Holy Spirit is with, is always with Jesus, okay? It's not that before Pentecost, there was no Holy Spirit. It was, you know, a vacuum of Holy Spirit, and that with Pentecost, Spirit, no. Holy Spirit has always been active with Mary, right? And many, many other situations in, in the Gospels where people are described as being full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, even Elizabeth, when Mary visited her. Okay. For he dwells with you and will be with you and will be in you. Verse 18. I will not leave you desolate. I will come to you. Yet in a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Found. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So here Jesus introduces the, the idea of keeping his word. Okay. He who loves my commandments or loves my word and keeps them. The task of keeping Christ's word is central and necessary to being loved by him and is central and necessary for participating for participating in Christ. Okay. Well, how do we keep God's word? Well, that's the regula, you see. The word is kept since, through so many ways. The words of scripture that we pray, the words of scripture that actually are the, the office liturgy, Right. So much of the words of the morning prayer and evening prayer are just scripture. But also keeping the word through the Eucharist, receiving the word into our bodies in the Eucharist, and through the preaching, and through hearing the, the scripture proclaimed, and through the prayers, and through the love that we have for one another. Because when we love another person, we keep God's word. So we keep God's word through praying of the offices. We keep God's word through the Mass. And we keep God's word through our personal devotion, loving the world according to the scriptural revelation. Those are all ways of keeping God's commandments. Down to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That's, this is crucial. Okay, this is very important. This is, a, is something that the faith hinges on, in fact. This, this verse, verse 26. The counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So receiving the Holy Spirit is what underpins the religious life of threefold regular office mass and personal devotion. So we do offices and mass and personal devotion to receive the Holy Spirit. And what does receiving the Holy Spirit mean here? but receiving he who teaches us all things. So we learn all things through the Holy Spirit, and we receive the Holy Spirit, which allows us to learn all things by means of the threefold regular offices, mass, and devotion. So the threefold regular is how we learn all things. 
the Holy Spirit being our teacher, our guide, our comforter. Okay. And what happens when we are taught by the Holy Spirit? What happens is that the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance all that Jesus has said to us. Okay, so what does that mean? It's the Holy Spirit who allows us to read the scriptures by means of the cross. It's the Holy Spirit that allows us to find Jesus in the works of the Old Testament, where Jesus is not named at all that God speaks or the Lord speaks or the angel of the Lord speaks, all these places where it's Jesus speaking, but it's anonymous on Jesus's part. Or all the ways that the prophets talk about somebody who seems a lot like Jesus. We are able to interpret those passages. There's boundless number of them. In the scriptures of the Old Testament, because the Holy Spirit is allowing us to read those words while remembering Jesus, remembering his death and resurrection on the cross, remembering his love, remembering Jesus's own acts of healing and of teaching and of loving and guiding, and chastising, rebuking, directing. We remember all of that by means of the Holy Spirit, so that when we read Isaiah, we can know that it's Jesus who's being described, or Jesus who is even speaking. Or when we read Genesis, and read that, and God said, let there be light, we can, through the Holy Spirit, know that that's Jesus. He's the utterance, the word of the Father. So we sort of take this for granted as Christians who have almost 2,000 years of experience, of literature, of writing, of theology, of prayer, of mistakes and, and insights and all the rest. Would not have been taken for granted by the young church, the upper room church, discovering for the first time how the Holy Spirit allows them to see Jesus in the scriptures and how the Holy Spirit allows them to see Jesus in the bread and the wine, indeed, as heavenly bread, heavenly chalice, as Jesus by means of the Holy Spirit. And they wouldn't have, they would not have taken for granted the ability to recognize Jesus in their fellow men and women and in themselves. Recognize that because they're made in the image of God and because God is Jesus and Jesus is God, that each and every one of us is made in the image and likeness of Jesus. It's nowhere in the Old Testament specifically. You have to have the cross, the light of the cross, and the Holy Spirit guiding us into the truth of the light of the cross in order to put all this together as Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. And it's the Holy Spirit who draws us into the mystery of all of this, and deeper and deeper into a, a reality a, beyond almost our ability to talk about it. Profoundly mystical. And this is called, this is mystagogy, which means being drawn by the Holy Spirit into the mystery of our participation in Christ who is in heaven. It's called mystagogy, being led into the mystery.
Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And the church started to remember Jesus' words, even the holy women in Luke's gospel at the empty tomb. Let me see if I can locate it real quickly. Yes, I can. While they, this is 20, this is the early in the 24th chapter of Luke. While the holy women were perplexed about this, not finding the body, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, angels. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. And then they go on to say, the angels go on to say, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And then Luke says, and they remembered his words. The Holy Spirit is allowing them to remember Jesus' words where he said that in order to enter into his glory, he must be taken, killed, and after three days rise. Jesus taught them, but it's only through the Holy Spirit that that becomes manifest and real. And that's what happened to the very first Christians in Luke's account who found the empty tomb, is that the Holy Spirit led them into all truth and helped them to remember Jesus' words. And that's how we have the Gospels. 30, 40, 50 or more years of preaching about Jesus by the apostles and by the early bishops and priests of the church. These sermons, these, this preaching and this teaching was what turned into the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and to some extent John, but definitely Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Built upon preaching, built, and what's preaching built upon? Christian preaching is built upon the words an example, an acts of, of Jesus. Remembering what he said is what was preached and preached and preached and eventually was written down by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's how we learn also about Christ, is simply remembering his words. And not just remembering the actual words, but seemingly remembering this, the deeper significance of, behind them or the revelation that comes out of them that somehow we knew already, but maybe we didn't know that we knew, if you know what I mean. Just a second, I need to check the time. Whoa, I'm getting a very good question here. Well, I'll address it in a second from somebody named Inside Out. I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> so, back to John, chapter 14, verse 26, which is really a, a hinge verse in the Christian faith. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And notice how uncategorical that is or excuse me, how categorical that is, and unqualified is what I meant to say. He will teach you all things. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches us all things. So to receive the Holy Spirit, which we do through offices and mass and personal devotion, all working together in a catac cataclysmically electric system of transformation, when practiced. The Holy Spirit, through the threefold regular, teaches us not just some things, but all things. Which is an amazing thing to think about. The last thing I'll say about this verse, and then we'll just pick up with this verse next time, is that we have to also, there's a profound significance to the fact that the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, and this is actually more significant than it might seem. 
The Holy Spirit is sent by the Father, says Jesus in John's Gospel. Which means the Holy Spirit comes from, is sent by, excuse me, he who is uncreated, Father. Father is uncreated. So is the Son, but the Son is begotten. Father is both uncreated and unbegotten. The Father is the maker of all things visible and invisible, seen and unseen. The creator of all. We have a hard time even thinking along these lines. But that's what the faith teaches us about the Father. And so it's from this place of profound otherness that the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father to us to teach us all things through the threefold regula, which is our baptismal way of being. And so what the Holy Spirit teaches is something that has no limit, has no box around it, is inexhaustibly mysterious, cannot be fathomed, while at the same time we are understanding things as we are drawn into the mystery, mystagogically drawn in by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is really, as a character, he has the characteristic of mystery. We need more of this in our faith, actively, I mean, to be comfortable and accepting and unfrightened by mystery, but in fact, knowing that it's, it's genuine mystery that's at the heart of it all which is why the Christian life is regarded as such an adventure. And so interesting and so provocative and so staggeringly profound and sophisticated, but also melts our hearts, melts our pride and our selfishness, transforms us because we're being transformed by that which is beyond time and space. Sent by the Father is a very important characteristic of the Holy Spirit. And if I have any, if I have any uh, Orthodox people watching, you know why it's particularly important. Okay, oh, it's David. David is inside out, okay. David's, David uh, asked a good question, and I'll try to address it, or at least start to address it now, although we're kind of getting towards time. David's question is, is theosis in us and Christ's transfiguration the same thing? Because he is acting through us? Okay, so let's set out by first defining these terms. David asks, is theosis in us? What does theosis mean? Theosis means it's the word used for being in complete unity with God. Okay. It is a way of speaking about our the, the goal of our Christian journey, the end, the telos. What's ultimate about our Christian journey, we, we describe as theosis, being at one with God, being completely made into, remade into God's image and likeness after the, the course of our bodily life, but in heaven, in other words. Theosis is how we talk about our participation in the heavenly reality completely, whereas right now it's partially or in a, in a sense of a, a kind of pledge. Okay. Christ's transfiguration is not the same as theosis in us. Okay. Christ's transfiguration is, is, is how he was revealed to three disciples as being God and at the same time revealing 
how he is light and and at the same time revealing heaven. A window to heaven was given to Peter, James, and Andrew, as I think who the three were. No, no. Peter, James, and John, I think is who they were. Now, Christ is acting through us. Absolutely. And then so in some sense, well, not in some sense, we are participating in heaven now. Not completely or not in any absolute sense. Theosis refers to participation in Christ in an absolute sense. Now we do so partially, or to use Paul's language, through a, a glass dimly. It's not always dimly, though, but, but not to the full radiance of being. But Christ is acting through us. He who is in heaven is acting through us. And we are therefore participating in heaven when we are consciously embracing that which makes up the threefold regular offices, the Eucharist, and our personal devotion, that is to say, our love of Christ, and our love of Christ in the world and in his creatures, loving and serving him in persons and in everywhere we go through our thankfulness, through our gratitude, and through our attitude and acts of love. Christ is participating and making all of that happen. Okay? It's not the same thing as being one with him in an absolute sense, which is the end or telos of our Christian journey. And that's what theosis refers to. Another term that you might hear sometimes when you, that's a synonym for theosis is deification. That's the Latin, it's the Latin string, um, strand of the language, being made like God, or being made God in some sense. Uh, that's the Latin deification. Theosis is the Greek, okay, being at one with God in an absolute, complete unity. I hope that you're getting out of this, brothers and sisters, a sense of the gift that the religious life is to us. You have to sum, I, I think it's important to know about what God intends by all this so that we know what to look for and what we can therefore understand as getting out of it or how we're how we're not just going through the motions or doing something because the priest demands or coerces us to do something, but know that to be able to pray morning and evening office is a gift to be able to celebrate the Eucharist, whether in the moment at the Eucharist or celebrating that it's coming up or celebrating that it just happened a day or two ago. All of it is celebrating the Eucharist and celebrating the Eucharistic reality. That's a gift. The Mass is such a gift. And our ability, because the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all flesh, all men servants and maid servants, upon rich and poor, male and female, no matter what, economic or, or uh, racial identity or anything at all, all people, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon. Because of that, we can find Christ wherever we go. And that is such a gift to recognize the giftedness of all this, I hope is coming through. And that's why Peter teaches on Pentecost, be baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of our transformed heart being able to be transformed by Christ wherever we are. as long as we accept the gift. As long as we say yes to the gift that has been given. I'll finish with, with a prayer.
O Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Ghost, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are never walking, excuse me, but remember that we are ever walking in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll stop now, and then we will meet again at 5 p.m. Central Time for our service of the evening office on this, the Tuesday in Easter. See you then. Peace.